milk and meat are staples in our diet. It is said that human beings are the only species in the world that consume milk of any kind after infancy. And of course, we know that meat is one of the staples of life, at least if you are a carnivore like myself. Now, maybe you're a vegan or a vegetarian and you see no appeal in meat. Uh, I remember growing up in the fields uh, talking to some of the workers that came from Mexico and I asked them what was the biggest difference about Mexico and America. And they said the food. And I kind of understood or kind of could guess what they were going with, but they surprised me. Uh, two of the things they mentioned that were so different was, number one, the difference between our tortillas. We have flour tortillas, where there they have corn tortillas. They said the second major difference between their food and our food was meat. The prevalence of meat. In the United States, or at least in my house, that there's no meat on the plate, it's a snack. Right? It's not a meal. You know, they would talk about going whole weeks without having meat, you know, and main sources coming from rice and from beans and other things. But, but meat is a staple in our diet, and the Bible uses these two things to talk about this. Let's look at our passage tonight. About this we have much to say. It is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, then you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. There's a difference between consuming milk and consuming meat for nourishment. We would not sit a T-bone steak in front of an infant, but in front of a six-month-old. That would be ludicrous. Uh, we understand the difference between the nutrition needs of a child and that of a, an adult. Uh, I'll give you two scenarios that are both real-life events. I know two separate individuals, both of which lost a child when their child was a teenager. Both sudden, both unexpected. Both families were members of the Lord's Church and had been for decades. One reached out to their church family for love and for support, and their family got through that tragic time. He is now an elder in the church and has converted over 100 people in his lifetime. The other individual was mad, angry, lashed out against God, lashed out against those in his congregation that came to him trying to console him in the midst of his grief. Two incidents fairly similar Two totally different outcomes. You may ask yourself, what was the difference? It wasn't the tragedy. And of course, I do not assume to know the level of, of pain that can be brought about by losing a child. I would never assume that on myself. But two similar situations and yet two totally different spiritual outcomes. The only thing it could have been was their spiritual maturity. One had chosen to live their Christianity on milk while the other had chosen to go on to the meat. Two stories of these individuals are true, and I know both of them personally. Thanks be to God, the individuals who lashed out against God after about 30 years of being away from the church have come back about five years ago. Thanks be to God. But I ask you tonight, do you want a fuller life? Do you want a life that is fortified in the faith of Christ Jesus? Do you want a life that is so solid on the foundation of Christ that no matter what life throws at you, no matter what Satan tempts you with, no matter what obstacles are put in your path, you can emerge to the fire victorious, having your faith still intact. The way you can do that is by having an abundant life, John 10.10. 10. And the way to an abundant life as a Christian is a mature life. A life where you have moved on from the milk of the Word and on to maturity. On to a life where you can stand the trials and the test of time. God provides the meat and the milk. He expects maturity. The writer of Hebrews and God Himself expected these Hebrew Christians to mature in their faith. Yes, they had the transition from 2,000 years of being under the Mosaical Law. 1,500 years. But they had to transition from this complete lifestyle change under Judaism to Christianity. And the writer of Hebrews says that when they converted, they were infants. And they needed milk, and that was okay. 
And when we come to Christ, we are infants. Some of us had to relearn theological ideas that have been impressed upon us since we were small children. Maybe some of us were unchurched and didn't have really any knowledge about the Bible or what it had to say. And so we were infants in Christ, and there is no shame in that. Just as the writer of Hebrews says, there was no shame when once you needed milk, but now... Now God expects you to be mature, to move on to the meat of the Word. And so it is okay to be infants and babes in Christ, but God expects maturity. And some of these Christians were not growing. But we can see from our spiritual examples throughout the Bible that we are supposed to grow. I think about the Apostle John. And we see in Luke 9, 54... As Jesus is exiting the town, they do not want to listen to Jesus' teaching or accept Him as the Messiah. And so as they're leaving, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, say to Jesus, Why don't we call down fire from heaven to consume the town and kill everyone? And Jesus calls John and James the sons of thunder because they're so brash and wanting to exert fire from heaven on these individuals. But you take Luke chapter 9, verse 54, and you contrast that with 1 John, which mentions love 46 times more than any other passage per capita uh, in the New Testament. John is referred to as the apostle of love because he has such a deep focus on loving each other and being patient with those who are struggling. Look at the maturity that took place in John's life from when he was a teenager in Luke chapter 9 until he was an older man in 1 John. And see how that maturity had changed the way he looked at the world, the way he looked at individuals, the way he looked at sin. It totally changed his lifestyle. We could also look at Peter. A few weeks ago, we had a character study on Peter and saw how his relationship with Christ had both high moments and low moments. But overall, you can see the maturity that took place in his life, especially from the time of him denying Christ in John chapter 18 to him in 2 Peter saying, I'm going to the cross, I'm about to be crucified, and I'm okay with that because I think it is a pleasure to give my body as a sacrifice for my Lord and Savior who sacrificed His body for me. To see the spiritual maturity that took place in the life of Peter is truly astounding. But also we can look at another popular apostle, and that is Paul. Paul had such a drastic change that he even changed his name. Paul saw meaning to be asked for or desired, and Paul meaning to be small and humble. We see how he was on the fast track to be a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, if you're not familiar with that terminology, the Jewish nation was under Roman law, but it was a theocracy. The people that ruled the Jewish people inside of Jerusalem were the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And as long as they didn't make too big of a fuss, the Roman governor didn't really care. As long as they paid their taxes and didn't make too much of an uprising, didn't really matter. That's why when Jesus is arrested, he's not taking first to Pilate, he's taking to the theocracy leaders, the high priests, Caiaphas and Ananias. And so here you have these 70 men in the Sanhedrin that pretty much ruled the show in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. Paul says that while he was a younger man, he was on the fast track to being in the Sanhedrin. Think of it as like maybe if we had a Congress that made decisions on how we were to worship, how we were to live, how we're supposed to dress, how we're supposed to interact with with non-Christians. All these things rolled up into one was the Jewish Sanhedrin, the most powerful men in that culture. And Paul says, I was going to be one of those guys, and I left all of it for Christ. In one of his epistles, he would say he counted all those things to be rubbish in the letter of Philippians. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8, he talks about how he has ran the race and he's finished the fight. And a crown is laid up for him and all those who have loved the appearing of Christ. We can see just how important this maturity, this life-changing gospel was to these individuals. It is sad when a child refuses to progress in the stages of well-being. If you had a, a, a child who did not mature physically, you would go to the doctors and say, what is wrong? He, he's, he or she is not living up to what their physical potential might be. And yet so many times Christians are not maturing in the faith. They come to Christ 
and five years down the road, ten years down the road, they are no stronger spiritually than when they first became Christians. They are no more well equipped to stand the test of temptations. They are no more well equipped to face the hardships and the trials of life than when they came out of the baptistry. And yet oftentimes people think that as, as being normal. That once they become a Christian their work has somewhat ceased. And that's not what our text in Hebrews chapter 5 tells us. We're supposed to develop and grow. My wife has many ways of testing her students. In the congregation, I know we have many teachers here, so you probably do something quite similar. When she's going through a new um, a chapter or a new structure in, in her lesson plan or something, she'll give them a test. And she'll take that test, and oftentimes the kids will do not so hot. 40s, 50s, 60s. There's always that one that breaks the curve and gets like a 97 that everybody hates, right? That was never me, okay? Um, at least I don't remember being me. Anyways, and so Brittany will go on and she'll teach the material, right? And then at the end of those lessons, whether it be a week or a couple of weeks, she'll have them retake the test. And those same kids who made 40s are making 80s. And the same ones that are making 50s and 60s are making 90s. And what she's trying to show them is, is that after instruction takes place, number one, you are expected to learn. Number two, you can learn. Because you know what it's like to be in high school. You come home from school and your, your, t your parents say, what did you learn today? And what do you say? Nothing. <laughs> right? And so this is a way to reinforce that, yes, we did cover something. You did learn something. And it reinforces the idea that, yes, you can learn, you can mature, you can grow. And as Christians, we've got to have the same mentality. Um, so when your friends ask you what the preacher preached about on Sunday, please don't go back and say, nothing. <laughs> you know. Because if you start doing that, I will be forced to start giving tests, okay? And then the tennis is shot down. All right, never mind. Um, but we're supposed to be able to grow and mature. We can learn. We can mature. And God expects us to do those things. We expect to have a greater knowledge after time and training. Christianity should be no different. Milk is needed for time, and God does provide that milk. Milk was needed in the initial transition from Judaism to Christianity. These people needed to be learned. They had to rethink their entire, entire religious system. Maybe you, when you came to Christ and the Lord's Church, had to rethink some terminology, had to rethink some things that you had been instructed, had to rethink some things that you maybe perhaps had always believed. God's Word is there for us to have milk. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, it says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Now, the key words here is milk and grow. We're supposed to grow. If we come to Christ at a level 2 Christianity and 20 years go by and we're still stuck on level 2, we're not doing what God has called us to do. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, we're told that we're all at different stages, and that's okay. It says, And we urge you, brothers, to admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. We can't expect everybody to be on the same level. Some people mature faster than others. Some people are going to be faster than others to grasp certain concepts or to be comfortable with talking to people about Christ. That's okay. Some people mature faster than others. It's like that physically. When I was in the 8th grade, I was the exact same height that I am now, about 5'9", and I weighed 175 pounds. Our junior high football team had three plays. Isaac right, Isaac left, and Isaac up the middle. I was a leading rusher and the leading receiver. True story. It's not a preacher story, okay? Everybody's like, man, this guy's going to be awesome. Okay? Senior year, still 5'9", maybe 185. Nobody's saying anymore, this guy's going to be awesome. Right? He had, he had topped out. Okay? As Christians, we can't top out. Right? Sometimes we mature faster, but we can't be like that person that peaks in junior high. Right? We've got to continue to grow. We've got to continue to mature all the time. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 13 tells us, For th Though by this time you ought to have been teachers, you need someone to reteach you the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the world of righteousness since he is a child. I don't want the Word of God to look at me and say, He's a child when it comes to Christianity. He's unskilled. He can't hold his own. He needs people to fight his own battles. Instead of being a source of encouragement for other Christians who are maybe less mature in their faith because they're newer Christians, 
he's, he's not able to stand on his own two feet when it comes to spirituality. He can't take care of himself. I don't want God to look at me like that. I want Him to look at me as a soldier for Christ, as somebody that He can rely on, as someone that, that people who are immature in their faith can look to for, for strength and guidance. And I know you hope and want the same things. But in order for you to have those things, you've got to mature. You've got to grow. And of course that comes by moving on to the meat that God has provided for us. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's a time for childishness, even when it comes to spirituality. But there's a time where God provides the meat and He expects on us to move on to maturity. These Jews in our text had not matured. They had been spoon-fed the milk and they had refused to go on to maturity. They would uh, not listen to the things that were being taught to them in the assembly. And so we have to be sure that we don't fall in the same trap. When the preacher is preaching, what are you doing? Are you sitting there? Are you thinking? Are you thinking critically about what's being said? Are you trying to find nuggets that you can take and apply to your own life? Are you sitting there thinking, man, I wish you'd hurry up. When we're in Bible class, are you there? If you're there, what are you thinking? Are you following along in your Bibles or are you just sitting there? Are you taking notes, whether in your mind or with a pen? Are you engaged? Are you asking yourself questions? Are you asking yourself, how does this apply to my life? And looking for ways in which these things can be applied in a practical manner. Because that's what people who are focusing on the meat do. The people who sit there and just mindlessly think about what's going on this week, what's going on later today, if the Titans are going to win, those are the Christians who are focused on the milk. And not to be upsetting or mean, but the Bible says that doesn't cut it. We've got to be sure that we're not allowing ourselves to fall in that temptation. And it's a temptation for all of us. When we're singing, are we thinking about the words? Are we thinking about, am I admonishing other people? Am I encouraging other people by the words that I'm saying? Or am I just got a, a, a mindless loop in, the, in my mind that's running around and I'm just saying the words? God provides the meat, but are we going to take a hold of that meat ourselves? Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but also in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Our spiritual growth is voluntary. It is up to you. It's not up to the elders to make sure that you're growing as a Christian. They have a concern over your souls and they're concerned about that. It's not the preacher's job to make sure that you're growing as a Christian. It's one of my concerns and I try to structure my sermons and my lessons to help aid you in that endeavor. It's not the youth minister's job to make sure that your child is maturing as a Christian. That's your job, both as a child, as a parent, as an individual. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, and that comes by focusing on the meat of the Word and taking that responsibility on for yourself. And if you do that, being mature in the faith will change the way you live. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23 talks about the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there are no law. We talked about this morning in our Bible school hour about how as we mature as Christians, as we have a deeper relationship with God, that has to be manifested in our actions and the way we live our life. Ask yourself, am I a mature Christian? Are you more loving now than when you first became a Christian? Are you more patient now than when you first became a Christian? Are you more faithful to the Lord and His church than when you first became a Christian? Are you more gentle and self-controlled now than when you first became a Christian? And if you can honestly say yes to those questions, then you have to honestly ask yourself, am I maturing as a Christian? Or am I content to stay the way I am? Am I content just to kind of wallow in the milk of the Word without actually wrestling with the meat and allowing it to change my life? If we choose to become mature, our lives will be blessed because it will bring us closer to Christ. Romans 8.29 says, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His dear Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
When we become mature, we become more like Christ. It blesses our spouses. It blesses our children. It blesses our church family. And ultimately, it blesses ourselves. We have to grow and mature. We cannot expect a new and recent convert to be as spiritually mature as a 20-year member of the Lord's church. But on the flip side of that, we cannot expect our 20-year members of the Lord's church to have the same spiritual maturity and zeal as someone who is a new Christian. We have to be sure that for those of us who are mature or who are supposed to be mature, that we're setting the example. That we're striving to wrestle with the meat so we can help those who are still struggling and growing on the milk. When we see someone who has failed to mature, it is disappointing and it is sad. Think about the pains a parent feels if their child did not mature when it came to either physically or mentally. Uh, Think about the pain that would cause that parent. Imagine the pain that God feels when He sees His child refusing to grow up in the faith, refusing to move on from the milk to the meat, refusing to take hold of that Christian maturity that comes with more responsibilities and more things that we can do in the faith to help others. We need to mature spiritually. We need to want the meat and not just to wallow in the milk. We need to because our lives will be blessed, John 10.10. The Jews had recently converted to Christianity in the book of Hebrews, and they were struggling. They weren't struggling because of persecution. They weren't struggling because of financial hardships. They were not struggling because of distress or family issues. And they were not struggling because there was some difficulty in their lives that they could not get over with. The reason these Christians were struggling was because they were refusing to mature in the faith that God had sent them. We need to be spiritually mature. Not because the preacher said so on a Sunday night, but because God demands it. Because it will make our lives better and fuller and stronger and more rewarding in Christ. People backslide from the faith each and every day. The Lord's church is growing. But even while the Lord's church is growing, people throw up their hands and say, you know what, it's not for me anymore. The vast majority of the time it's because those people never matured in the faith. They stayed on the milk and they stayed on the milk and they stayed on the milk and a real hardship in their Christianity fronted them. And they decided, this obstacle is too hard in my faith. If they had been training themselves, if they had moved on to the the meat of the Word, if they had buffeted their body, as Paul said he was actively doing to himself, they could have overcome that obstacle. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 promises us that. Chapter 10, verse 13 says that God will not allow us to be tempted anything beyond our measure. But the question is, are we moving on to that meat? Don't just have life. Have an abundant life. Don't walk through life being spiritually immature, refusing to grow closer to God. Don't just be satisfied with the milk. Feast on the meat of God's Word and mature spiritually and take a hold of that abundant life. And so tonight, ask yourself, how mature am I in my faith? Am I allowing myself to be transformed by God's Word? Or am I just sitting there not making any real advancements in my Christianity? If you're not, ask yourself, why not? Is it a personal issue? Is it because there's sin in your life? Is it because the zeal for God and His Word, His church, has not been the flame it needs to be in your life? Ask yourself, if I'm not maturing spiritually, what is the problem and how can I fix it? And then simply change. Fix whatever obstacle you have in your path and grow as a Christian so other people can rely on you and their walk in Christ. Maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you aren't a new babe in Christ. Maybe you've never confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Been baptized for the remission of your sins and started that walk in Christ. If you have a need tonight, whether to ask your brothers and sisters for help in your maturing process or you need to become a Christian, if we can help you any way as the Lord's Church tonight, please come as we stand and as we sing.